American 65, Kane Calvin, wait, four left short, line up and wait. American 65, four left short, line up and wait. Hello, everybody. Welcome to San Francisco, California. Welcome aboard our Douglas DC-6 in United Livery. It's a pretty looking plane, isn't it? We'll turn her up a little bit. Douglas DC-6B mainliner. Let's uh, let's open her up because who knows if we'll actually make it to landing again. Look at that. You can even see the little seats in there. Yeah, very cool. And the engines have the United colors on them. That's really cute. It's pretty. It's pretty. Now this plane comes from a slightly different location than my usual spots. I found this this plane in a particular location, and um, they made some statements about how it should work um, between Steam Edition and non-Steam Edition. Whatever. I run the non-Steam Edition, and it's working. Turn it down since so we get inside. All right. Beautiful looking interior cockpit. Not so beautiful back there, but that's okay. We got all kinds of buttons and bells and whistles and things. All right, are we ready? Are we ready for this? The Douglas DC-6, piston-powered airliner, built by Douglas Aircraft Company from 46 to 58. All right, are we ready? Are we ready? Are we gonna take off time? Take off time? All right, what are we powered by? We got four Pratt Whitney R2800 CA15, 16 or 17 double wasp radials, 2400 horsepower each with water injection. Ready guys? Look at, look at, look at the exhaust ports guys. Is that not awesome? They actually modeled the flame coming out of those exhaust ports. Let's not drive the plane off the runway there. Okay. Look at that. That is beautiful. That is some serious attention to detail right there. Let's see if we can get her into the air. Where is our airspeed? There it is. Okay, we're crossing 100. Let's see if we can get her up in the airplane. I want this view. There we go. In the air. Track those big wheels. Look at that. Absolutely beautiful. Originally intended as a military transport near the end of World War II, it was reworked after the war to compete with the Lockheed Constellation in the long range commercial transport market. More than 700 were built. Many are still flying today in transport military and wildfire wildfire fighting roles. You can even see, look at the smoke. Uh oh, hold on. We're going to crash. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. We're not, we're, we are stalling. We're dead. Ah! And we're back. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> uh, it didn't work out so well for us, did it? No, it didn't. But we do get a nice close look at those, those exhaust ports. I'm going to stand on the brakes here. Look at that. Hear that, that high-pitched squeal? Those are the brakes. They modeled the sound of the brakes. All right, let's, let's try this again. It's known as the C-118 Liftmaster in the United States Air Force and as the R-6D in the United States Navy prior to 1962. Uh, where the U.S. Navy changed their designation to the C-118. It was commissioned as the XC-112 in 1944 by the United States Army Air Force, wanted a lengthened pressurized version of the DC-4 base C-54 Skymaster with more powerful engines. By the time it flew on 15 February 1946, the war was over, and the Air Force decided it didn't care. Oh well. Douglas Aircraft modified it into a civilian transport, and the civilian DC-6 first flew 29 June 1946 and was retained by Douglas for testing purposes. First airline deliveries were made to American Airlines United Airlines on 24 November 1946. Unfortunately, a series of in-flight fires, including the fatal crash of United Airlines Flight 608, grounded the DC-6 in ooh, 1947. 
The cause was found to be a fuel vent next to the cabin cooling turbine intake. So then all DC-6s were modified and the fleet was flying again four months after being grounded. This sounds familiar, right? Not, not super familiar, but familiar-ish. Remember the DC-10 jetliner also had a grounding due to some design problems. By April 1949, United, American, Delta, National, and Braniff were flying DC-6s in the United States. United flew them all the way to Hawaii. Braniff flew them to Rio de Janeiro and Panagra. Panagra, who is also another airline, apparently, uh, flew Miami to Buenos Aires. KLM, SAS, and Sabena flew DC-6s across the Atlantic. Uh, BCPA DC-6s flew Sydney to Vancouver and Philippine flew Manila to London and Manila to San Francisco. What's... We're stalling again. Why are we stalling again? Can I get... Can I recover the plane? Why am I... My airspeed is more than enough to compensate. And this time with feeling. <laughs> Jeez. I glanced out of my airspeed. I'm like, I'm at 260. I'm well beyond stall speed, but apparently not. Whatever. Whatevs. She's still a beautiful plane. Even if I can't fly her for crud. Uh, Pan Am used a DC-6 to start transatlantic trans tourist class flights in 1952. Uh, those were the first DC-6s that could gross 100. 7,000 pounds. They had CB-17 engines. They were rated at 2,500 horsepower on 108, 135 octane fuel. Several airline, European airlines followed with their own transatlantic service. The DC-6 A, B, and C subtypes could perhaps, could sometimes, not perhaps, but they could sometimes fly nonstop from the eastern U.S. to Europe, but they often needed to refuel in Newfoundland and elsewhere sometimes when they went westbound due to wind conditions. We're just going to keep our flaps down for now. There are four variants of this aircraft. The basic DC-6. There is the longer fuselage, higher gross weight DC-6. Let's go to the fixed spot view, shall we? There we go. We, as Microsoft's Flight Simulator fails to compute what I'm asking it to do. There we go. Beautiful plane. Uh... The longer fuselage, higher gross weight, longer range version, which was the DC-6A. Uh, no, I'm sorry. There's the basic DC-6. The DC-6A, which has cargo doors forward and aft of the wings on the left side. DC-6B, which is passenger work. DC-6C, which is convertible. So the basic DC... Okay, I got it. So the basic DC-6, and then everything was longer and higher gross. I really need to do a better job of writing out what I'm trying to say. Good lord. Now, the interest in this aircraft was revived during the Korean War, and the Air Force and Navy ordered 167 of these aircraft, which eventually became civilian. There is a very famous one named the Independence. That was Harry Truman's aircraft. It was the first presidential aircraft. It was the short fuselage DC-6, VC-118. And she is today in the presidential hangar of the Dayton Museum, the Air Force Museum in Dayton, Ohio. It is a beautiful place to go. I would highly recommend if you get a chance, go to Dayton, check out the Independence. You do need to, to go early to, to sign up because it's actually on the active base versus the museum, which is not on the active base. Total production of the DC-6 series is 100 and, uh, I'm sorry, 704 aircraft, including military versions. Interesting, 1960, two DC-6s were used as transmitter platforms for educational television based at Purdue University in a program called the Midwest Program on Airborne Television Instruction. They were basically flying transmitters for uh, the Midwest. Many of the older of these aircraft were replaced with DC-7s. But the simpler, more economical engines in the DC-6 has meant the type outlived the DC-7, particularly in cargo operations. DC-6s and 7s survived into the jet age were replaced eventually by the 707 and the DC-8. True of this aircraft, three or four 
She could carry 42 to 89 passengers or 28,188 pounds. That's 12,786 kilograms of cargo, depending on the type rate. Cruise speed of 311 miles per hour. That's 501 kilometers an hour. With a max payload, uh, she could fly 2,948 nautical miles. That is 5,460 kilometers. With max fuel, she can fly 4,100 nautical miles. That is 7,600 kilometers. This aircraft is quite the plane. Let's get inside and check out our views. Shift one. There's a nice up close and personal view. Now there is this engine supercharger here that you can flick to high, but you're gonna get this warning. Emergency power unavailable. That is due to the difference in various versions of Flight Simulator X. They actually describe how to deal with that um, in the help file. Read the help file. Two, there is our comm unit. Three, there's a GPS. Four, there is our throttle quadrant. There's our overhead unit. Plenty of electrical power and boost pumps. And the beautiful thing is, I happen to know this. Listen to this, guys. Listen to this. It sounds like flicking a switch. That's awesome. What was that for? No, that was five. Six, there's a further overhead panel with all kinds of panel data there. Seven, there is the co-pilot seat. Eight, radio altimeter, communications, navigation, polar path compasses. Nine, quiets everything and you have a radio. The problem is once you do that, you can't get the plane's noise to come back to, to full, which is kind of weird, I happen to feel. But this aircraft, She's a beaut. Um, it it takes a lot of work. I'm I'm literally flying this sucker by the seat of my pants, which is why we crashed so many times. This aircraft requires you to truly fly it like you would have flown it back in the day. That does mean you need to set all of your engines properly. You have to manage your fuel consumption. You have to manage your mixture, your props, and all of those things to properly fly your aircraft. I don't do that. And so we crash a lot. But there you go. This is the Douglas DC-6. Beautiful looking airplane. Worth checking out for your hangar. Till next time, I'm not even going to try to land this thing. I've been Derek Tebbers. <laughs> Happy flying, everybody. And please don't crash your DC-6 into the water every time. It's a bad idea. So, good evening, ATL 101 Heavy. I did 101 Heavy. Good afternoon. Wind 0908, 4 right, to land. On behalf of the flight crew, thank you for flying with us and have a pleasant stay.